see about what fashion could look like, the more the tragedy of this becomes really kind of manifest, just like you can't believe how this has been allowed to happen. And I know that in the, in the film, there is a, a guy who you interview, an academic, mm. who actually gets very frustrated at one point and sort of shouts, my God, we can do better than this. And that is how I feel most of the time at the moment. Because I'm seeing the puzzle, you know, I'm seeing how, uh, what a development tool, um, as we always say, it's a full spectrum industry, as you really see in the film. It employs millions of people. It has a captive audience. You know, it has consumers who love it so much. Imagine if we could turn that into the amazing kind of industry that we know it can be. So I think what really uh, is the issue for me at the moment are the barriers, the blockages, and two years on from Rana Plaza, we are beginning to discover, I think, that there are systematic, consistent, and well-organized attempts to block progress mm. and the fashion revolution that we all want. And I think that, that for me, that's where I am at now. And in terms of all the issues that go into it, I think we sort of saw there's a sort of smorgasbord of issues. There's obviously the human cost, which has different impacts in different places. Um, and there is the huge environmental cost as well. A lot of those tally, so they're very, very interconnected. And I think what we're starting to see now is that uh, it's become such an investment opportunity. It's become such a hyper, a turbocharged form of capitalism, this part of the, the sector that we have to think that brands, retailers, investors, markets are looking ahead the whole time. So what we have to be very careful is that they don't just throw uh, Bangladesh and other countries with all their garment workers in a trash can, so to speak, and move on, which is what they're starting to do, actually. Okay. Andrew, how about you? I mean, you came, uh, as you pointed out, from outside the fashion industry. So you, mm -hmm. you kind of, from the bottom up, traveled around the world you know, spoke to hundreds of people, experts, uh, people on the front line of the problem. How do you see the problem? How do you frame the problem? Um, I think it became uh, incredibly human. And I, and I even, um, when, when I went in, we kind of framed the film like there were these two sides of the coin we were gonna look at. We were gonna look at uh, human rights issues and then environmental issues. And one of the things I was struck by is, um, n number one, on the human rights side, just how powerful a difference it makes to go from talking about these people or about these facts or these numbers to, uh, I mean, you saw the very beginning of Shima's story. And um, I think when you're face to face with these situations and you're realizing this is this individual's one experience on this planet and this is someone's life, uh, we've commoditized labor as if it was the same as a raw material. Um, so the human side got very personal, but the environmental side got very human as well. Because I think a lot of times we talk about environmental issues, and it's really easy to make that a very esoteric, like existential, hard to get our mind and our hearts around. And in the film, we go to you know several parts of the world. We see we see the impacts of these things we call environmental issues that again are directing human life today. And I think, um, yeah, I just think it all became. Um, painfully personal, like I, I knew the research, I knew the facts, I knew the figures, and um, was still just totally unprepared for what I experienced. Mavia, you've just come back from Bangladesh yesterday? Yeah. Okay. You know, how, you know, and this is, a, this is an issue that's you know, very, very close to your kind of personal yeah. passion point. Yeah. You know, what are your well, thoughts now? Um, well, I came back yesterday extremely pissed off. <laughs> but also with a very, very, very clear image that in all this hugely complicated system um, that is not even a fashion system anymore, like Lucy said at the beginning of the movie, you know, there used to be one and now there isn't anymore. You know, there is the government accountability, um, factory owners accountability, brands, you know, the, the, it's so complicated. But there is one bad guy in the mix that has, led, that has actually built this, ish, built this system so well in such a complicated way that it could really get away with murder, literally. And it's the fast fashion brands. Um, you know, in the five days that we were in Dhaka, 
with Harriet, um, and talk, we talked to everyone. We talked to garment workers, to judges, to government, to factory owners. Every single time you come out thinking, the brand's new. They know, they know everything. They know everything. The way that they, you know, they, they build this system by which, you know, we started, how long has fast fashion existed? 20 years? 20 and, years. you know, they, they arrived in these countries. They, in the name of democratization and bringing wealth and lifting millions of people out of poverty, they arrived with promise and, you know, they started manufacturing in these countries. And then slowly, slowly, they enslaved them by you know, increasing the volume, decreasing the cost, and, 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 and enslaving the factory owners as well into the system. Um, sometimes with compliance, compliance measures, so in a very legal way, sometimes in other ways. Um, and then at the same time, they started to addict us, the consumers, to this, you know, to having the newest, the cheapest, um, trend in, 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 in this second. And meanwhile, NASMA, um, a, a union um, leader that I met two days ago, you know, said very, very clearly on camera, she said, you know, Olivia, I see these multinational corporation, com fast fashion companies, they post their uh, profit, yearly profit online. You know, they're all public and they are billion pro profit. And meanwhile, we, die in the name of this profit. The consumer is becoming poorer and poorer. The garment worker is enslaved. The factory owner is trapped. The reason why the guy, I'm not justifying it, is a, you know, he's in prison, he hasn't been you know, sentenced yet, but the reason why he sent the workers back into the factory to work that day at Rana Plaza is because he had a, 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 a quota under his neck that if he didn't deliver the order for the brand, by that deadline, he would have been fined and lost all his money and all the work. So the brand, and the brands know this. They know it. They let it happen. So they know the factories they're producing. They know the capacity of the fabric. They know how many garment workers work there. They know that, and yet they still place these orders for huge number of volumes that then they have to deliver at that deadline. And they know that they can't do it unless they subcontract it to someone else. Right. Sometimes the lady subcontract, sometimes they don't. And then if something happens, oh, but we didn't know they were subcontracting. Yeah. You think, really? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, in the, in the, you know, even, even the last few minutes, you've all raised uh, different vantage points, and it's a very dimensional issue. Mm -hmm. um, but l let me break it down into three concrete parts in terms of how we can maybe address the problem and discuss it in a little bit more depth. You know, I see, it, I see it this way. I see it that, you know, one major stakeholder, ma one major constituency, as you've point out, pointed out, uh, Olivia, is the companies, the fashion companies, brands, and the relationships with the factory owners. The second major constituency is governments. You know, a lot of these low-cost markets um, don't have, you know, health and safety rights for workers. They don't um, support unions. They don't have uh, minimum wages that you know, can sustain a, a decent lifestyle. And so, you know, governments have a role to play too. And then I think the third um, constituency is perhaps the one that's not discussed enough. It's the consumer. And that's the consumer. Yeah, totally. Because, you know, each of us, every day, we, almost now, you know, with this industry we work in and we live in, you know, we have choices that we can make about what we buy. Um, and so I, I want to discuss the problem in three parts. So let's talk first about the companies. And Livia, this is you know, a clear passion point for you. But you know, what, if you were, if you were you know, advising the CEO of one of these big companies, what would be the first, few, and, and that CEO was committed to making a change and committed to the issue. So it wasn't about convincing there was a problem and it wasn't about um, you know, them understanding the importance of it or you know, the impact on profit or whatever. But where would you start what, based on what you've seen? Well, you, it is extremely important to have long-term relationship with the factory where you're producing, which is a genuine long-term commitment. You know, there are plenty of high street companies, uh, not fast fashion companies, because it's not convenient for them at all. 
to have long-term relationship. But there are plenty of ice cream companies, plenty of other brands like Safias, you know, People Tree, who have really started, you know, with factories and grew them sustainably. We visited a factory in Chittagong um, called Pacific Jeans. They um, has been operative for 20 years. They only produce jeans. The, the factory owners have, have, you know, invested in its people, in the in technology, in the brands they've been producing with, with them, some of the high street brands, they're producing with them for a long time because they trust them. You have every single brand knows exactly what they produce. And every single brand has the interest in not, you know, in, in the pursuit of, of, as Lucy said, of constantly squeezing the, 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 the cost. You know, the interest is possibly not engaging too much, um, but they have to. So if I was advising the CEO of, of one of these companies, I would say, you know, you have to have long-term relationship with the factory. You have to, to, to engage and take responsibility for their, you know, for their functioning properly. Every brand knows how much the employees, the government workers earn. So they know. Last year, but they, when I they, they shirk responsibility because often, at least from what I've learned, um, as we put together this issue, they shirk responsibility because so many of these relationships are man managed through agencies. So they say, mm -hmm. we're not directly employing these people. You know, we don't employ them. Um, they're not on our books. We're just, you know, but, you know dealing with an but agent. But that is interesting, isn't it? And why are not directly dealing with the factory? So that they are not responsible. But they still are. And I think that's the point, but right? But legally they are not. Right. And this is why. Yes, no. Lucy. Can I, can I just make a comment on what the CEO of a fashion company aspires to be or should look like? And it's a lot of it is messaging to the market. And um, as I say, you know, I think in the film, um, Andrew makes the point that post Rana Plaza, fast fashion brands had their best year ever. And that's also because there has been a shift and it became a very um, specific investor proposition and it's become a turbocharged uh, sector that people want to invest in. So there's a lot of looking at the market and CEOs thinking, you know, this is my responsibility is to keep pushing. Fast fashion brands that are perceived as successful are the ones that are, are expanding. H&M uh, opened 400 stores in the first quarter of this year. You know, that's big. There's a lot of expansion. Um, and what we need are CEOs, fashion CEOs, who have a backbone. But, you know, when you, how do you do that at scale? So, you know, the, the reality of the situation is we have H&M, and we mm. have Zara, and we have Topshop, and we have that whole host of brands. They have, you know, hundreds, thousands of stores that, you know, we did a big piece on Inditex in our, in our issue. They make yeah. almost one billion garments a year. Mm. Yeah. When you're Why? running a company... <laughs> Well, do we need one more billion garments yeah. a year? No, we do not. This is the elephant in the room, you know, and it's a good job that we brought it up now early in the conversation. Mm -hmm. But this is this this perpetual growth. I mean, we had a, a very interesting seminar in the House of Lords um, and someone from H&M joined the panel. Uh, good for them because no other brands would. Uh, but they couldn't tell me when I said, what is your plan? Is your long term plan to keep expanding? They, they said yes, basically. And so that, for me, is a real issue because that's where the pressure's coming from, partly. Which, which raises another issue that came up in, in the film, and I thought it was very interesting, which is, you know, is the capitalist system that underpins all of mm. this, which creates companies that list on the stock market, mm. who are then measured on a quarterly basis to grow. Because that, that, mm -hmm. that drive for expansion, mm -hmm. as much as it comes from demand, mm -hmm. it also comes from the need for these companies to please the markets. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is it just that the capitalist system is fundamentally flawed and unless we change that? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you maybe to, to bridge into the idea of governments here, I mean, you have created a, a system that incentivizes behavior that is fundamentally at odds with where we need to go as a human race. So like you talk about consumption, um, you talk about resource scarcity, you talk about growing population, you talk about waste, you talk about, you should go down the list, and you realize we've created what we've called a free market system that externalizes all of the costs. You know, any of these major brands, they are, they are set in a model that is, yes, absolutely, commoditizing human labor at a, at a level that should be 
far in our history by now, but also they're using vast amounts of resources that are not being even accounted for. Like, the, I mean, it's, it, Lucy makes a comment later in the film, like the closer we get to the edge, the faster we go. And it's kind of like, I think there has to come a moment where we look and say, the kind of future we want to have, we're not going to get there by continuing down this path that's leading in the opposite direction. So from a government standpoint, you know, people, especially where I live, people, people hate words like regulation. People hate words like, uh, but there has to come a point where you say, wait a second, business, and we can demonize it or we could praise it, business from, from, you know, from Safi's example to H&M, business is a force. It is a raw, ruthless, powerful force that can lead us forward or, or hold us back. And it's not going away. And it's not going away, and it shouldn't go away, but the role of government and the role that we can then get into with consumers as we start to be a part of the conversation is the, 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 the idea that this is a competitive game we're playing, but there's gotta be rules. Part of the problem, as I mentioned earlier, is that a lot of these markets the governments Don't are regulate. in active conversations with big foreign companies mm -hmm. because they want to attract them to come to these markets like Bangladesh, Cambodia, Ethiopia. You know, I, I was visiting for factories in Morocco um, earlier this year. There's an active conversation between these companies and the governments because they want to attract them. And part of what the companies are attracted to is the low-cost labor market. So it's not in the best interest of getting foreign uh, companies to come in um, to, to increase w wages. I mean, on the regulatory side, there's a couple yes. of things I've seen. There's certain government agencies that are, you know, more actively starting to look at this. Yeah. And then there's also things like the, the Accord, which yeah. is uh, in Bangladesh, um, which is a, a, a kind of an independent or, you know, se a coalition separate from the government that's yeah. trying to put into place some rules and standards. How should we be dealing with regulation? Should it come from governments or should it be coming from the industry? And how do we create a standard that works yeah. across the world? Well, yeah. first, two things that came out very, 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 very strongly from the trip that we did was that there is a need for transnational regulation, one on compliance, so factory compliance standards, and one on labor and, and wages. Because what everyone said in Bangladesh is, is if you put the whole country of Bangladesh in, in check with the you know, health and safety, with the compliance of the factories, government workers, the brands, as Lucy said, will go to Myanmar and, and Vietnam and Cambodia and Ethiopia, which are they're already doing, because they don't have that. So unless you take, you make these rules worldwide and then the companies are accountable wherever they produce in the world, and however they do it, or it's not going to work really. Who should make the rules, though? Well, by the way, to that point, though, I mean, yeah, yeah we're, we're living in a gap in history where we're operating in a global society, but yeah. we're still living in nationalistic rule sets, and yeah. that's broken, clearly, yeah. to that point. Mm -hmm. But in the interim, uh, developed countries that know better could could refuse to turn a blind eye. I mean, you know, places like the United States, certainly Europe, we, we, we have the Clean Water Act. We had unions that fought for, like, and, and we're not oblivious to the fact that then when the production moves elsewhere, that those things aren't taking place. So there's a lot of fresh conversation right now about rules and regulations on, like, imports and on, you know, starting with the governments of the world that do have a lot of control and a lot of say um, till we can get to a more globalized world. It's interesting because on tax, there's been a lot of talk in the last two years about companies like Starbucks, Amazon. You know, they make billions in, mm -hmm. in, in one country, but because they are registered in another, mm -hmm. they don't pay the tax. And it should be the same with, with legislation and labor rights. Mm -hmm. If you produce in a country that is not the one where you're resident, why should you apply, not apply the rules, the minimum, wa minimum wage or labor rights of the country where you are? You know. The problem is that trade rules have been set up to facilitate this business model. I know. So actually, there's, you know, it is very tough to find uh, legal remedies that will you know, uh, enforce the kind of action that we need to make sure that Rana Plaza doesn't happen again. And unfortunately, the two years since Rana Plaza, we've absolutely... What we do know, maybe this is a good thing, we, we know categorically voluntary action from retailers does not work. We know that, okay? 
the question is, what do we do next? And I think we now have um, something like true cost is so, so important to me because it robustly says this sector's massive. It really matters. People are very interested in it. It's in a real state. And we now need to talk very seriously to legal experts, human rights experts, to policymakers. And now is the shift. What do we do about it in a substantive, forward-looking way? Yeah. And in all this chaotic <coughs> situation, we go back to the consumer. We are, we are so powerful. We have a huge power. Our vote whenever we buy something is huge. So, you know, me, why we wait for the governments to understand, for the brands to, you know, to get away with murder or not? We can choose, we can. Do we really need this? piece of clothing that we're about to buy in that very second. If you answer yes, I'm going to wear it. I, you know, Lucy told me, and I, I, can't, I haven't stopped quoting her for two years. Oh, I hope you it's know, right. If you, if you, <laughs> at, the mo at the moment of purchase, at the moment of purchase, ask yourself, will I wear it a minimum of 30 times? If the answer is yes, buy. But you will be surprised how many people don't. Yeah. The other question that you well, know, and I, I have to say this real sure, quick on that, sure. just on the yeah. consumer point. I, I've never met a consumer. Like I've never met an individual that said like, that introduced themselves to me. As I a am. A <laughs> I'm a consumer. <laughs> but we have we have taken in this incredible story over the last few decades that has cast us as people in a role of just taking in things, and it's made us separated and disconnected from the impacts of our choices all over the world. Yeah. And I am probably most hopeful, like yes, we can talk government, yes, we can talk brand, but like what happens when the world starts to wake up and connect the dots to things they care about? Because the world is starting to really care. Like that's a beautiful thing. But when we connect the dots back to personal choices like clothing, you could see something really happen. And I think honestly what I'm seeing is I'm seeing like we've come through this time of like a lot of cynicism where we've seen our governments kind of let us down. We've seen corporations uh, let us down and not you know, uphold the things that they said they were gonna uphold. But the upside from that is now we could be living in a time where people wake up and realize like Superman isn't coming. Like someone <laughs> else isn't gonna fix this. So we could step exactly. into it. Yeah, I mean the question that you know, I often think about you know, walking by some of the stores um, on Oxford Street and you see these advertisements <coughs> or these signs for, you know, here's a bag for five pounds, or um, here's a pair of denim jeans for eight pounds. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, you said this in the film, Andrew, that you didn't often think about how, who made your clothing. Mm -hmm. And what's really powerful about this film is it really brings to light the kinds of people that are making our clothing. And the fact is the true cost of of that kind of model is being placed on vulnerable people who have, a, have no one defending their rights. Mm -hmm. So you might be getting those jeans for eight pounds or that bag for five pounds, but the cost, the rest of the cost, the fair cost of making that product is being borne by someone else. For me, the clear message here is there's no single entity, person, individual, company, institution, government that's to blame. I mean, as I said in the introduction, we're all responsible. <coughs> And we're responsible by the decisions we make as owners or, or CEOs of brands. We're responsible as people who can influence uh, the choices that our governments make. And we're responsible, at the end of the day, individually as consumers. Jenny Holloway, uh, fashioncapital.co.uk. Andrew, does your film develop further the idea of onshore production? Because we've got a factory in North London. We employ 104 people. It's actually a social enterprise. And there seems this misconception in the UK that you cannot be competitive. Well, you can be competitive. And I was just thinking about the lady that's making all that cotton in Texas. And presumably she exports that all over to Bangladesh. And the green footprint alone and all that, that travel of garments. Now, there is so much that can be sung about homegrown production today. Yeah, I think it's a great. I think it's a great point, and we, we, yeah, we spoke with a lot of people that are involved in it. I mean, I, again, it, when you start internalizing the real cost of transportation, to your point, you start to see a very different picture of what's what's profitable and what's not, or what's competitive and what's not. And um, yeah, I think there's a lot of really dynamic uh, areas of solutions that we certainly touch on in the film, and that's that's absolutely one of them. Tamsin Blanchard from the Telegraph magazine. Um, is it? really possible to slow down fast fashion? 
I mean, can we make H&M slow down? I think it is because, you know, I've been thinking, of, I've been trying to play with this idea for various months now. And um, I remember I pointed Andrew towards a, an economist in, um, in Milan who features in the film, Guido, because we've been working together on, I, I, there was a moment where I thought, certainly the fast fashion business model is finite. Because if you, if you think about the amount of natural resources that the industry is using and the slavery side, you know, clearly in 10, 15, maybe 20 years time, the natural resources are getting scarcer and scarcer. You know, the water to irrigate the fields, the co every, from every single point of view. And the slaves are gonna start to unite, uh, like it's happening in Bangladesh, a lot of women are forming unions. There's gonna be revolutions. And if the revolution are not driven by fashion, they're gonna be driven by raising food prices and you know, all of that. So in the landscape is gonna be very, very different. Now, if you're a company who wants to be successful in 15, 20 years time, you have to address these issues today. You have brilliant enlightened CEOs like Paul Pullman from Unilever has started to do it five years ago. This year he had to defend the fact that, you know, to the market that his profit instead of being, I don't know how many billions were one billion less because he's tackling these issues and poverty. And, but if you are a smart businessman, you defend your business and you think it, in the long run, you don't think about the quarter um, uh, reporting for your shareholders. And fast fashion brands are not thinking like that yet. So it is possible to do it because they're heading towards a, a crash. They, they're not gonna be in business anymore. But then if H&M's opening 400 stores in Now, today, quarter, but I mean, what's like, gonna happen in 10, 15 years time? They may, you know, they're gonna start going this. So the, I'm not an economist, but clearly something, you know, is the curve is not gonna go up for forever. Hi there, I'm Susie Lau. I write a fashion blog called Style Bubble. Um, I just wanted to ask, we talked about voting with your wallet. Would you say that voting with your wallet is a luxury afforded to only a certain part of the population? Anyone want to take it? Anyone want that I question? Take it. <laughs> there are two things to say here, okay? Like, first one, I'm 45. When fast fashion, um, when I was a young, you know, 18, 20, 25, fast fashion didn't exist. So I try, I sometimes I, I, I say to myself, how did I get dressed then? I didn't have any money, I was, you know. Um, how did I get dressed, how did I go to parties, how did I go to work every day, how did I do it? Because, you know, I didn't have what the kids this age have today. Um, so our spending, our, the way that we build the, uh, our wardrobe was very, very, very different. And I still do it like that. Um, and there is, and it relates a little bit to the price per wear. So let's take my trousers, they are Stella McCartney, I bought them three years ago, and they were quite expensive. Now I can't remember exact price tag, but it, they were expensive. Um, and they don't, so even, say, they don't even zip off, do they? No, no, so <laughs> say, say for the sake of the argument that I, I, I paid 200 pounds, okay? For this pair of trousers. In three years, I mean, I don't know, I know a lot of you are known for more than three. I wore them like a minimum of three, four times a week. I wear them so much, almost every day. And if you divide how many times I wore them from how much I paid, they're cheaper than Primark. I'm Sarah from Fashion Revolution uh, Day and also from the Ethical Fashion Forum. And um, I just wanted to touch on a point that Imran made about how businesses will stop expanding or opening new stores if it makes business sense. And it kind of actually touches on you know, Livia's point about um, how we value clothing. And what the problem is, is it, it making business sense is valued on one thing, and that's profits, that's money. And actually not costing the things that in the long term will have a cost, you know, the environment, um, people, labor, people's lives, um, these things that aren't at the moment counted as a, a financial value. The experience of making the film for me was an experience where we started over here with clothing and the further into this world you got, the more you started to look around at the whole series of systems we've put in place in our world and said some of these are fundamentally outdated and just flat out wrong. Like mm -hmm. we've told and believed stories in certain cases that weren't true 
But the, like I said at the beginning, that the amazing part of that, and I think the part that we forget, I think we, we grow up being told so many times the way the world is, we're explained the way things are, and I think we forget, we lose sight of the fact that we can choose the way the world will be. Like, it can change. And when you look at a system and, and a set of issues like we're looking at today, um, it's unprecedented in human history to be looking at the amount of real, quantifiable, growing pressing concerns to the human race. And I think this is a moment that we're going to be accountable for. This is a moment that, like, I'm going to be accountable for. And it doesn't, you don't have to have kids to feel it. You, don't have, you just have to be a part of the world right now to say, I don't think putting it on cruise control and letting multinationals run the show has worked. I don't think governments have been the full answer because I think too many of us have resigned ourselves from the process as if it's something we could re-engage with later. And I think the entire system needs addressing. I just want to say thank you to everyone for coming. It's a Friday afternoon and um, yes. coming out here to engage with us on this very important day. We're really pleased at BOF to be part of um, this global conversation. And I want to thank Andrew, um, you know, when we first connected, I kind of felt something with you over Skype that day. And I'm so, <laughs> you know, sometimes you get that feeling. Well, I got that feeling about he Andrew. It's an amazing film. Yeah, yeah and this an film, I, I believe this film is going it's to be one of, changer. it's going to be one of those things that gets this into the mainstream. And um, you can all help with that too. So take the things that you've learned today, share them on your social networks, use the hashtags, uh, BOF Voices and FashRev and share the things that you're going to do to make a difference, right? The things that we've learned from Lucy and from Livia and from Andrew and all of the work that they've done on the front line to better understand this problem, we can all benefit from it and take action from it. So um, thanks to all of you for coming. Thank you to the Thank Ham Yard you. Hotel for hosting us. And um, please um, go out and, and do your part in making a difference. And, and we, check the website of the film. And check and out the True Cost. True it's cost out on, the, on May 29th. Yep. Um, but you got your first look here. Uh, and it'll be available for download on May 29th. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>